Hi, you guys. Uh, Hi. Good to see you. My name is John Horgan. I'm a veteran science journalist, and I also teach at Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, which is right up the road for me here in Hoboken. And we're here today to discuss this brand new book written um, by uh, Deepak Chopra, Jack to Tuzinski and Brian Fertig. And I'm hoping we can provide uh, an overview of the book. I've read it and I really like the book. I think it's it's very timely and it brings together a lot of it, uh, fascinating information on the connection of uh, quantum mechanics to all sorts of things. But I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the co-authors can tell us something about it, tell people who haven't read the book why they should read it. So um, I'm going to start by asking people just to give brief introductions. Deepak, I think we can skip you. Everybody knows who you are. But uh, I'll start with uh, Jack. So Jack, where are you and what are you? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, I'm currently um, in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a professor of biophysics at the University of Alberta, where I've been for more than three decades. Uh, I also teach at the Technical University of Turin in Italy uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And uh, my interests have uh, varied over the years. I, I started out in sort of mainstream quantum physics, uh, physics of phase transitions, critical phenomena. I gradually moved into nonlinear dynamics. And I always was interested in biology, but biology was maybe not interested in me. Um, it was... <laughs> It was not really um, uh, suitable for serious physical uh, physics uh, in, um, investigations. Now it's different that since the past maybe 20, 25 years, biology have, has become a very um, uh, complex, interesting, fascinating science. So I moved to biophysics about two decades ago. And uh, from there on, I, I spent 15 years in the Department of Oncology at the Cross Cancer Institute here doing computational drug discovery for various types of cancer. And then in the last three years, actually, I moved toward uh, investigations of um, electromagnetic interactions with biological systems. So it's a real fusion of physics and biology. Um, that's in a nutshell uh, what I've been uh, doing the past uh, two and a half, three, three decades. Oh, uh, OK, great. Um, yeah, I can see why Deepak wanted you to be a co-author on this book. Um, so Brian. Um, who are you and and you're you are where right now? I'm in Piscataway, New Jersey, in Edison and Broadway Central, New Jersey, a number of hospitals. And um I'm on staff at 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 HMH Hackensack Meridian um, Hospital. It's a network in JFK. And a few hospitals with Robert Wood as as well. I'm an academic. Uh, associate professor with HMH and a and with the medical school, and a clinical associate professor with Robert Wood. You know, I'm an endocrinologist and uh, a clinical endocrinologist, but I enjoy the academia and I enjoy the fusion with um, with physics and um, and now with spiritual. The spiritual domain. It's incredibly fascinating. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to come back to both you guys, but let me ask Deepak now why this book and why now? It's a long story, John. You've gotten to know me a little bit. So I trained in neuroendocrinology with Seymour Reichlin in the 19. 70s, mid 1970s, Seymour Franklin, who's now 97 years old and in good health. If he catches a snake in his garden, he would look for neuropeptides in the midbrain, even today. And he argues with about consciousness with me, who I'm, of course, one of his students. 
and he's a luminary to me. So in the 1970s, uh, when people were not familiar with uh, words like serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin and opiates, uh, one of my colleagues, Candice Burt, who was training at Georgetown with another great endocrinologist, George Solomon, she she said, you know, we were looking under the microscope at some molecules and she said, these are the molecules of emotion. And that struck me. And I became a fan of what we now call mind-body medicine, integrative medicine, and looking at these molecules that whatever happened in consciousness obviously had some effects in biology because there were receptors to these molecules all over the body. And then the question arose, you know, there are receptors, but also the body sense makes the same molecules that the brain makes in response to emotional experience. So I got interested in where is the mind? Is it in the brain or is it in the body? And then I got uh, even deeper into Eastern wisdom traditions. They said consciousness is not in the brain or in the body. The body and brain are experiences in consciousness and consciousness is non-local it doesn't have location in space time it doesn't have any form um, it cannot be accessed through a system of thought but it is what makes all experience possible whether it's mental experience biological experience so i've been basically on the road for 35 years 53 years now if i think about it since i left medical school um, just obsessed with consciousness and the mystery of our existence. And, you know, I've created these models that have been ridiculed um, by the mainstream. But then, you know, I uh, met Jack a few years ago at the Science of Consciousness. And Jack has worked with luminaries like Sir Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff. We published a paper together on zinc metabolism in uh, in the brain and Alzheimer's. So Jack became very close friends. Then through Jack, I met uh, Brian, realized that he's written these two amazing, magnificent volumes on uh, quantum metabolism. So I thought maybe, you know, if I partnered with them, um, we could bring these ideas uh, to the mainstream medical as well as the physics establishment. As Jack said, physics is not been interested in biology, but if, if the physical world ultimately is quantum in nature and our body is part of the physical world, then our body has to be part of, uh, it has to be quantum in nature. I don't have the science that say these two gentlemen have because they're very much more still in academia but you know we we did this book because we thought it was timely mind body medicine is accepted epigenetics is, is accepted the fact that experiences change our biology is accepted but we still don't know where experiences happen they don't happen in the brain there's no experience in the brain you can put a knife through the brain and there's no subjective experience on that. So the brain records the neural correlates of experience, but you know, where experience happens is a fundamental mystery of our existence and has been talked about from Plato to Aristotle to, you know, to recent times now, Sir Roger Penrose. And um, so that's why I thought this would be a great partnership to do this book with these two really solid academics who know much more about the math uh, of quantum physics. I know that John is a student of quantum mechanics. He's been studying the math aspect of it, which, you know, is kind of mind boggling. But right now, as I go on things like uh, chat GPT and AI, and I ask questions like, uh, is morphogenesis and differentiation quantum mechanical? Is intentionality quantum mechanical? Is sensory processing quantum mechanical? Is motor activity quantum me mechanical? And I get support for these ideas that I never knew that there was support for them. But now it seems slowly mainstream medicine and mainstream uh, physics is um, moving in the direction of um, a more fundamental reality, which is even beyond 
quantum. I would say the formless consciousness in which we all participate, including this conversation. To me, it's mind boggling that this conversation is being processed in consciousness, which has no location in space time. It's also uh, being enabled by quantum technologies, which seems appropriate. Um, Jack, uh, there's so many questions I could ask you. Uh, but what what is the main takeaway that you want people to have uh, from this book? What what message did you really want to deliver um, in this collaboration? Oh, Jack, you're uh, you're muted. Yeah, you're yeah, muted. There's a lot to say about this. Uh, from my perspective, um, my motivation in a way was to to uh, encourage the uh, interrogation uh, of this um, of, of the human body the human mind from different angles not just physics not just biophysics not just uh, you know medicine or cell biology but in an integrated fashion i think it was a great opportunity for me to uh, to work with brian and with deepak because they bring different perspectives and and uh, another thing is um that um, you know, historically, when you look back at things like quantum mechanics, the, the beginning of quantum physics uh, more than a century ago, it, it, it happened very rapidly and uh, it took over the field of, of physics uh, after 350 years of classical thinking, deterministic thinking. And um, I think I see historical parallels because what changed everything for physics were several experiments, only several unexplained experiments. The first one, of course, was the black body radiation that that uh, Max Planck explained uh, sort of against his own um, convictions, still being rooted in classical physics, right? And and now I see similar things in biology, and we actually jumped to to medicine, where of course the consequences of this kind of thinking will be seen. So in biology, we we, we have a lot of um, conviction that everything is um, you know, driven by diffusion, by chemical reactions, binary reactions. But, you know, um, Deepak mentioned um, embryology and morphology, form uh, and integration, uh, synchronization of these. It, it cannot be explained by this kind of classical thinking. It simply cannot. And in, in addition to this, there are some concrete examples where we now know that quantum effects are harnessed by biology. Uh, for example, uh, you know the um, photosynthesis, which is the the beginning beginning of all energy processes in all life forms. We start with uh, the energy from the sun, uh, light rays, photons, uh, striking uh, the, the surfaces of leaves, and chlorophyll absorbs it and transforms into electronic degrees of freedom. And that down the, down the road creates glucose. And, and, and then, of course, plants become um, the food for animals and so on. So the food chain uh, is based on, on quantum processes per se. And we, we uh, went deeper because um, metabolism in, in eukaryotic cells and human cells is also demonstrably quantum in nature from at least two points of view. The, the first one is that there is actual um, quantum tunneling of electrons in the electron transfer chain in mitochondria. This is this would not be possible by classical movement of charges. It has to be tunneling because of the potential barriers and so on. And, and the second thing, which is a bit less well known, and I guess this is how uh, Brian approached me because he, Brian was um, aware of these papers, uh, unlike most of the doctors, I believe. Uh, no disres disrespect to doctors. I think they're fantastic professionals, but they don't need to know quantum metabolism yet <laughs> um, in the future, probably. So so this is the second aspect is so-called allometric scaling laws. Uh, allometric scaling laws of physiology go back to 18th century and, and they were um, they were studied by uh, Lavoisier and, and French um, scientists. And then later on, Kleiber in early 20th century cataloged it and found nonlinear dependence on size in uh, in the energy consumption and production. And that was never explained until recently um, using actually scaling laws, which are used in quantum physics. 
um, that actually led to the Nobel Prize in for uh, Peter Debye in solid state physics explaining specific heats of solids. And now uh, with Lloyd Demetrius, my colleague uh, who, who, who is at Harvard and Max Planck uh, and myself, we wrote several papers which uh, kind of explain this uh, mathematically uh, and, and very, I would say, um, very um, elegantly, I, I'm, not bragging, I'm not bragging here, but but it's a very elegant uh, explanation. So what I'm trying to say and, and cut to the chase here, that there are several um, um, compelling uh, stories about quantum effects and biology so far that uh, just like in physics 123 uh, years ago, um, will change the, the way biology is perceived as a, as a science because it'll be, um, this synchronization, uh, coherence, and organizational perfection that that you know, Brian talks about a lot can only be explained at least using current knowledge by quantum mechanics. So that was my you know, long explanation why I got into this because I really think that that's the message that has to come across to a wider audience and biologists first, medical doctors late. Well, I would say medical students because I think these people will be the the ones who transform the practice of medicine down the road. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I want to come back to you at some point and ask you if you have a favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics, because I've been writing about the debate over what quantum mechanics means for decades, and I, I'm more confused than ever. So maybe you can uh, tell me what you think. Uh, so Brian, um, can you tell us what you really want to tell people, uh, readers of this book. And also I'm hoping you can say whether quantum medicine is a thing yet. Is it is it something in the process of being born or is there something called quantum medicine right now? Well, those are all, there's a lot to say there. Um, <laughs> thank you, John. But you know, I, let me it's, it's, give a little backstory about why I initially wrote this book, Metabolism in Medicine, and, and it was really for the purpose to try to better understand biological systems through the lens of physics and, and energy flow. And fortunately, I mean, it was also this, this lofty goal that could medicine, could we advance medicine to find new frontiers that aren't in outer space, they're right here in our backyard. And so fortunately, very fortunately, I connected with Jack and Jack is just an incredible intellect and, and uh, talent. And, and by the way, Jack is a, is a nominator for the Nobel Prize in Physics. He's been hired by a number of of several countries in Europe to organize your science. And so not only did Jack edit the first volume of this book, but he guided the process of finding a transformative potential for the future of medicine and a model which we call the physiological fitness landscape model. And it's able to predict and prevent the onset of disease and predict the patient response of therapeutic interventions. Um, so, but biology or quantum biology and quantum metabolism is a natural intersection with mind body and, well, spirit, the spiritual domain. And this led us to connect with Deepak. Um, and, and ultimately the writing of, of Quantum Body. Now, I don't have to tell you, John, that Deepak is just a great man on many, many levels. And uh, first, I just want to say that that it, it it's such a proud feeling and privilege to share the front cover of this book with these two giants, you know, great men. Now, you know, in terms of what is this ready for prime time, quantum biology in terms of medicine, 
you know, you know when I was growing up, um, when we were all growing up, in going to school, the, the most fundamental tier of, of medicine is, with, or, or, or the life sciences with biochemistry. In the late 1990s, it became molecular biology. Now it's quantum biology with a, a, an interest in a justification for the application of quantum biology to clinical medicine. Now, microtubules, based on the Penrose Hammerall model of consciousness, appears to be vital in the storage and processing of, 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 of consciousness from which emotional and natural intelligence have emerged. And it, while disturbances of these microtubules appear critical for the, the, the pathogenesis of chronic disease, you know, these, these were examples of the emerging role of quantum biology in, in medicine. I think these are beautiful examples of this, and it's only going to, you know, not to mention the, the effect, the, the significance on mind, body, and, and mental focus, and the, 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 the effects of this will have on, on, on health and healthcare. So I think that's another um, major, I mean, I mean, obvious application, which we're already using in Deepak uses quite a bit with meditation and yoga and the like. And I think these are gonna play an important role. But just, the, just think about the, the definition of consciousness from, from Sir Roger Penrose defines it as it's an awareness, an awareness of awareness, awareness of perspectives. And this is necessary for understanding to be able to connect dots of these different perspectives to, for creative insights. And this in turn is necessary for natural intelligence, which is the application, real world application to problem solving and, and, and uh, and, and, and the application is, let me just finish up with, with the application of this a, for, from a healthcare perspective. And I think the natural intelligence that, um, or the emotional intelligence that, that healthcare practitioners must have involves an awareness of the perspectives, a robust, well-rounded perspectives of a medical topic as well as of the patient, their fears, their expectations, their biases, their belief systems. And to be able to harness this in the, in, in, in the uniqueness of the individual patient for the optimal problem solving for that individual. So it, 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 if, if you have, for example, a you know, an obese patient, you're gonna have a prescription of, of that's gonna be unique to the individual of various lifestyle um, changes with or without pres prescription agents, pharmaceutical, pharmacological agents, and which ones? And then with or without a bariatric surgery, which one? And it's gonna be unique in terms of the optimal problem solving given the patient and the uniqueness of that patient and the, the, the experience that patient has. So I think these are all examples, John, of, of where we're going with quantum, just the, the, the quantum biology, the understanding of where it evolves from. And I, not to belabor it, I'll just say, because I'm sure there'll be more opportunities to describe this. But I think my major interest is in the intersection of quantum metabolism with physiological perfection and, and how it, it connects with consciousness, which the, the and free will, and free will is the quantum biological expression of consciousness, as, as Deepak has described, and that really resonated with me. So, and, and there's many, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, give you the others a chance. To... Before you ask your next question, I just want to share with you, these are two volumes 
I'm holding on quantum metabolism, the metabolic landscape of health and disease. And these are two volumes written by our friend Brian Fertig. I'm still struggling to understand much of the math and, and you know, the deeper insights that he offers in these. And before, uh, I, I'm curious to hear, um, I'm curious to hear Jack's uh, favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. But while we were having this conversation, I went online and I asked uh, an AI chatbot about Erwin Schrodinger's interest in consciousness and Vedanta. As you know, Schrodinger's equation is the basis of all quantum mechanics. And this is what I, I, I found uh, from his book, What is Life, 1944. Schrodinger wrote, the Upanishads are the most comprehensive philosophical treatise ever written by man. They are based on an ancient idea as old as Indian thought itself, that the most profound reality is one, and this one is identical with our own self. There's no room for a divided self in the Upanishads, no conflict between our true self and the outer world, no dichotomy between mind and matter. Schrodinger was particularly interested in the Vedantic concept of Atman, which is the eternal self or reality. He believed that the Atman is identical to the wave function in quantum mechanics. And that to me was amazing that Schrodinger was talking about consciousness and wave function as being identical with the one ultimate reality. And, you know, we now, all our physics is based on Schrodinger's equations, but actually if you say this in public, uh, among scientists today, they'll roll up their eyes. Um, you know, they say, what nonsense. But I'm just quoting from Schrodinger right now. So I'm curious, um, um, what is Jack's favorite interpretation? But go ahead, sorry to interrupt. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I want to get back to Jack, but I want to ask you a question now, uh, Deepak. Um, I, I'm going to push back a little bit against um, one of the big themes of your work for as long as I've known you and even before that. And um, it, I'm, it's taking off from what Brian just said. It seems to me possible that you can have quantum medicine that remains entirely materialistic. There's just an understanding of quantum processes and how they're involved in metabolism, how they might be involved in uh, neural activity. And you don't have to have any of the metaphysics about consciousness. You don't have to have the challenge to materialism um, that you mount in your own writing and your, your uh, speeches and so forth. So do you think that's possible? Why do you need the metaphysics? Why do you need the idea that consciousness is somehow primary for quantum medicine to happen? Well, on the one hand, I agree with you that you can have a materialistic paradigm for quantum mechanics and be done with it and not invoke anything that's mental or emotional or consciousness linked. But then uh, John, any, any look at reality that excludes mind or emotions or consciousness is not complete. I mean, even if we come up with a unified field theory, you know, gravity, strong, weak interactions, electromagnetism, that's the whole spiel. How does that give rise to intention or feeling or emotion or insight or intuition or creativity or higher consciousness or transcendence? So I, I'm, I've always been a student of Vedanta as, you know, uh, all my life. And so I'm always looking for ways to actually say that science without including consciousness is going to be incomplete. After all, even science is an activity in consciousness. Uh, theories are conceived in consciousness. Experiments are designed in consciousness and observations are made in consciousness. So, you know, how can you have science without consciousness? So say that's my bias. And one of the implications of what you just said is that while we're waiting for quantum medicine to emerge, there are these practices that we can engage in to actually improve our health, our mental health and our physical health. And all these practices include, uh, you know, uh, influencing your autonomic nervous system. And during the, 
the COVID pandemic, it became uh, very clear that people who were having um, high morbidity, high mortality, also had sympathetic overdrive, they had inflammatory storms, and yet no one was talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, which has been a fascination in the yogic traditions, how breathing, how yoga, how mindfulness, how reflection, how transcendence actually influence autonomic activity that counters the sympathetic overdrive. So now, because of neuroplasticity and, um, and epigenetics, we do know that every mental event influences our biology. And you're talking about quantum metabolism, this huge two volumes. My first insight into this happened as a resident. One day I was speaking to a patient and I said, Mr. whatever his name was, I said, I'm afraid you might have cancer. And as soon as I said that, I saw his face got crestfallen, his blood pressure rose, I'm sure his body um, metabolites showed inflammation and cytokines, heart rate went up. And then in the next minute, I realized uh, that I'd made a mistake, I was reading the wrong chart. So I said, I'm so sorry, that wasn't your chart, you're, you're perfectly healthy, that is somebody else's chart. And immediately his demeanor changed and his biology changed. And I said to myself, one little bit of information and its interpretation changed this guy's biology in a few seconds from one thing to another. So I didn't have the expertise that these guys have, but intuitively I knew that, you know, information or even how you interpret, you know, you can dismiss it now. Placebo, nocebo, these are words we use when we don't understand what's happening. But now we understand that something very fundamental is happening with information and how we interpret information. And where is information? It's in consciousness, nowhere else. So, you know, I can't help going back to my fascination with what is reality? Why do we exist? We have created all these models for existence, but like you, the more I study these models, the more confused I get too. So this book is not about any revelation. It's about enlarging the conversation more than anything else. I think the conversation needs to be expanded to beyond simple materialism, which has yeah. failed us to tell you the truth. Um, all right, thanks. Okay, back to, uh, so Jack, now I think uh, we've set you up for your uh, favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. And at some point, either maybe in your answer, but I can also have a follow-up question, um, talking about how quantum mechanics uh, relates to information as something that might be fundamental to reality. Sure. So, so you know, uh, let me preface this by saying that uh, especially in regard to biological systems and, and even the human mind, I, I think that something is missing uh, uh, in, in our conversation because people who talk about quantum mechanics and, and biology, quantum biology, they always refer to things like, you know, single particle experiments, very simple, uh, almost rudimentary um, aspects of quantum mechanics where you have a photon striking an electron and, and then the electron changes the direction and and you know, in physics, in physics, we can follow these kinds of events. In biology, at least for in, for the foreseeable future, this is not achievable. We we are not at this level of resolution, uh, let alone you know um, precision. But uh, so so I think in terms of um, statistical aspects of quantum mechanics, the consequences for many particle systems, which is even a single cell, will have you know trillions of atoms in it. And, and therefore, if we translate quantum mechanics literally into, into such uh, systems, I think we are um, risking uh, a very naive approach. Uh, and I think um, um, the, a better approach is to look at, let's say, consequences in terms of uh, what happens for the entire system, uh, like a cell or maybe a tissue or organism, if we assume that the underlying uh, physics is based on quantum principles. Mm -hmm. So that kind of actually frees me from the interpretation because I jumped right into statistical uh, or quantum statistics. 
And, and that is, uh, that is by the way, what, what happened with uh, quantum metabolism, because it's based on um, the thinking that was used um, in about 1935 or so to explain the um, specific heats of solids at low temperatures. And, and Einstein, by the way, um, is one of the instances where he was wrong. He, he assumed that, uh, that all the, um, the solids composed of independent quantum oscillators. And that led to an incorrect answer to that question. So he's at least once he was wrong in his life. And, and instead, Debye uh, corrected this and he said, no, no, these oscillators are co connected by little quantum springs and they create waves. And when you look at the wave um, distribution of these waves, the properties of the quantum waves, then you get the right answer, which is experimentally demonstrated. It was for some time already. And I think that's kind of a better approach uh, to, um, to biology uh, from the quantum uh, standpoint. Look for examples of collective behavior, which is not explainable by you know, linear um, um, billiard ball type of collisions, but something which is collective. And that's kind of leads us directly to the book where we really emphasize on the collective behavior of the human body, the systems. They are not independent, it's all interconnected. And that's also links links uh, to mind body uh, connection that Deepak mentioned as fundamental to our health, and even deeper to microbiota body mind connection, and of gut brain axis. All these things cannot be mechanistically uh, explained by you know these um, domino like uh, effects. It would be too slow, and we we are actually much uh, better organized than that. So to answer your question, uh, I because I, I come from this point of view where st quantum statistics, statistical um, uh, explanations um, are linked directly to experiment, I like the, the Copenhagen interpretation because it's probabilistic and probabilities lead to statistics. And everything else from my, I mean, I would say naive perhaps, maybe not sophisticated enough point of view is a little bit overthinking it. So if you just, <laughs> I remember when I was a student, uh, our professor, you know, we were trying to come up with all kinds of, um, you know, ingenious ideas about quantum mechanics. And the professor said, stop it, just do it. <laughs> In other words, you know, write it down, solve the equation, and, and then you will, uh, you'll be happy with that. Um, but yeah, the Copenhagen interpretation, I think withstood the test of time. I, I don't see um Anything which is better than that, there are all kinds of exotic things, the pilot waves, Bohmian, and you know, and there is um, uh, multiple verse, multiverse, you know, I, I'm a nuts and bolts physicist, so, so I like, I like the simplest uh, possible explanation. You're, you're expressing the view that is commonly known as shut up and calculate. I yes. took a course in quantum mechanics a couple of years ago, and that my, my professor was too polite to put it that way, but he basically said, just do your homework, figure out how to solve these equations, and don't worry about what all this means. You know, the, the underlying, uh, what I really like about quantum mechanics is how elegant it is mathematically. And also how it um, reflects classical mechanics, you know, the Hamilton's equations formulation uh, of classical mechanics. You can see the same uh, um, the same concepts translate into quantum. That to me is very con con uh, convincing because beauty, uh, be if something is beautiful, it must be true. To me, at least. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, all right, Brian, I've been saving a big question for you. Um, Somebody has already mentioned free will, and uh, I know free will is important to you. It's very important to me. I've been writing about free will for a really long time. There's a lot of discussion of free will right now because Robert Sapolsky, the Stanford neurobiologist, just wrote this book, Determined. And meanwhile, there's another neuroscientist, Kevin Mitchell, uh, who's written a book that could be called anti-determined. So Sapolsky says, no free will. And this other guy, Kevin Mitchell, looks at much of the same science and says, there definitely is free will. So Brian, what's your take on, on free will and whether it relates to quantum mechanics? Well, thank you, John. Uh, you know, the, Robert Sapolsky, is, and his, this book that you're referring to is... Um, 
you know, he says that none of our behaviors, actions, and decisions are voluntary or, or by choice, but rather they're predetermined, right? By genetics or the environment, biological factors in the environment, essentially saying that we have no free will. Now, I can accept that on, in, in some cases of an impaired or deranged consciousness where we do harm to ourselves and to others. But, but I reject this notion that, that all of our actions are inescapably deterministic because consciousness is an awareness of perspectives, a healthy consciousness that allows creative insights and thus flexibility in what we do. Now, even my, my involuntary, felt like an involuntary decision to write this, this medicine and this um, in metabolism tome that, that spanned a tortuous 10 years, that was the, the epitome of free will, even though I thought it was, um, it, 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 it was involuntary at the time. But I, let, me, let me just give some perspective on my thinking of, of free will. Now, what's most inspiring and, um, and important in life is, is not what you do, it's why you do it. It's, 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 it's knowing how um, our motivations and free will um, are, are, are uh, beneficial to ourselves and to others and understanding and believing what is our cause. This is physiological purpose, which equates to free will or willpower. They're the same. They're the, the, the motivated not only to, for the acquisition of food for which the brain principally evolved, but for many modern day vitalizing challenges, such as winning a sports competition or an academic accomplishment or a, a, um, a, a, uh, it, it, a, uh, it, it, a, a service for the community. Now, free will is the essence of what we are. And many of the challenges of free will are metaphorically tantamount to survival. But fortunately, we're entangled in a world motivated by physiological purpose, not just to survive as individuals, but to help others do so as well to promote the joys, the opportunities, the health and general welfare of others, which are inextricably tied to those of our own. Now, when you reach down and lift others up, you lift yourselves even more. And I believe that this is rooted in a biophysical process of quantum entanglement that connects everything in the universe. I know Deepak agrees with this. And, and it's interesting that, that Albert Einstein um, said, you do something good, something good comes back to you. It may be in a day, it may be in a hundred years. Now, this could be karma, this could be the um, Newton's third law. But I think the, this quantum entanglement is more fundamental than, than that. Um, it's the 2022 Nobel Prize winning experiment of quantum entanglement um, th that, that by you know, three, three uh, physicists, um, there was a Clauser aspect and, and, and Salinger, they looked at these electron pairs and separated the pair miles apart with each having a separate spin and flipped the spin on one and the other instantaneously flipped. If free will is the biological, quantum biological expression of consciousness, right? Then plausibly, this is arguably, that, that somebody, that the free will of somebody that you helped in many years ago would be responsible for others coming to help you with a major challenge today. And similarly, you helping somebody today would come back and help you many years from now, perhaps in another lifetime. And I just find that to be fascinating. And it, free will is something that doesn't age, 
And it's the ultimate part of our consciousness that connects the physiological perfection. I mean, if you're playing a football, I want to look at the 2007 New York Giants that beat the 18 and 0 um, the, the, the New England Patriots. Patriots. They were absolutely unbeatable, right? You tied, I think, a 9 and 17 that, 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 that beat this team. And that ball, that last, that touchdown winning catch by Plexigo Burroughs from Eli Manning, those 300 pound linemen said, they, they said, that ball is in the air so long, we thought we could run down and catch the ball. And what that says to me is that is, you're not, the minute you, the, the, the present becomes the past. You're living in the past. But now this is the, the, this is a quantum manifestation of consciousness, free will, and metabolism that drives the physiological perfection, not only of the individual, but between individuals in this phase locking phenomenon, which is, I just think that is a beautiful <laughs> example, right? And as a, as a Giants fan, I love the connection of quantum mechanics to um, what I think is the greatest football game of all time, which is the uh, the New York Giants defeating the Tom Brady Patriots. So, yeah. If, if, up I, to may, that. if I may, can, can I just add two thoughts yeah. to it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the first one is, you know, when I teach biophysics, I always ask students what they think is the difference between living systems and non-living systems, because we you know, talk about biology and physics. And physical systems follow the forces. Bas basically, the forces, Newton's laws, second Newton's law, tell us what will happen, right? Um, in the classical sense, anyway. But but biological systems decide where they want to go. Even a single bacterium, you know, uh, will you you will not be able to guess the the movement of bacterium a priori. So all of life, in my opinion, is based on free will to some. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a distinctive feature of biological systems. And, and the second comment I want to make is based on what Brian just said, and maybe Deepak would uh, be interested in writing another book, follow up to this one would be not quantum body, but quantum society or quantum planet maybe, because this, these examples give us this connectivity, which either metaphorically or, or literally is a hallmark of quantum um, behavior. I just I, I just wanted to point out that we're we're nearing the one hour mark and uh, and I wanted to ask a kind of big question. I wanted to put this uh, to Deepak. This is a very difficult time in human history. People are very frightened. A lot of people are in despair. I think one reason why the free will deniers um, are so persuasive right now is because many people feel helpless. And Deepak, I just wonder if one of the goals of writing your book was to counteract that sense of fatalism and despair by presenting um, this physics-based way of looking at the human condition that is more hopeful. Yes, the short answer is yes. I just came back from the kingdom of Bhutan where I was at the invitation of the king and the queen, and they parceled out a la piece of land about the size of Singapore, the country of Singapore, and based totally on the idea of the awakened mind, following the principles of compassion, loving kindness, joyful equanimity. And this is what they want to create a whole country around this. And I think now at this moment, the time of despair is basically that climate change, a non non sustainable biosphere, even our own biology, social economic injustice, war, terrorism, and mechanized ways of killing each other. It's happening in Ukraine. It's happening in the Middle East. When I went to the kingdom of Bhutan, I saw the celebrative mind there celebrating existence and grateful for only one thing that we exist and that we have the awareness that we exist. For me, that is a worthwhile endeavor to take society in the direction of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. 
and maybe the quantum mechanical model is the right model, maybe it's not. You know, uh, when I was debating Richard Dawkins in, um, in Mexico, I quoted uh, Freeman Dyson, I have his book here, Infinite in All Directions. And you know, in the book, <clears throat> Freeman Dyson says, every quantum experiment uh, forces the atom to make a choice. That's the quote I used. It's a well-known quote of Freeman Dyson, but Richard screamed at me. He said he couldn't have said that. If he said it, he was wrong and he should sue you. So I wrote uh, an email to uh, Freeman Dyson and copied Richard on it. I said, I quoted you, did I make a mistake? And he said, no, you didn't make a mistake, but there are three riddles. And I'd like to end this conversation with these three riddles because we'd run out of time. He said, three riddles that have occupied me all my life. Number one, the unpredictable movement of atoms and particles. He didn't say random, he said unpredictable. Big difference, okay? Unpredictable to me, maybe not random inherently like going to Grand Central Station, seeing everybody randomly walk here, but every particle or every human is going to a certain destination. So number one, the unpredictable movement of particles and atoms. Number two, a universe fine-tuned for mind and consciousness. And number three, our own consciousness. I don't know the answers to these riddles, but I have a feeling they're connected. So I think if anything, if this book can expand the conversation we're not trying to solve any mystery it, it, it's not solvable i don't think the mystery of our existence or even the awareness of the mystery of our existence is solvable but any model that expands that conversation to help create a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world is worth it thank you so much that's a great way to end and uh Best of luck, all of you, with this book. I really think it's great, and I think it's going to find a big audience, and um, and it should because it's uh, it's something that people need out there. So thank you for writing it. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you.